We are Story Luck, and this is my good friend and storyteller, and he's a writer. He's based out of Boston, and he is Zach Stewart. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm here with Dan Boyd, who is a writer and storyteller out of Chicago um, and the founder of Story Luck. Good to see everyone. Welcome. Welcome. We got 18 submissions this time. We looked closely into our hearts, slash I passed off all the work up to Zach over there, and uh, he picked 10 fantastic stories that we are going to see today. To vote on these stories, I'm going to have to give you guys a link of where to vote. Now... We're going to want you to have a Twitch, and you're going to have to give up your Twitch name and your email. That way we know you didn't vote twice, and we'll have the list of all the Twitch people who follow us. So go ahead and do that. That should be down around there somewhere. There should be a follow button, uh, and you can create an account and follow us. Uh I am so excited about showing stories through this video streaming process. I never want to go back to doing things live. How, how are you feeling about that, Zach? Yeah, I think giving people the opportunity to do multiple takes allows them to do like their best performance. Um, I think there is something special about live performance, but you get such great stories when everything's recorded so i'm really excited to see um all the stories that we have today okay so we're gonna start out with joanne's story and give us one second we're gonna cue that up and here you go this is not my first time in a boxing ring but here in brooklyn the stakes are high because my opponent is the champ the women's heavyweight champion. Now we're just sparring, that's practice fighting, but a crowd gathers around the ring because she's the draw, not me. I started boxing late in life, in my 40s, and I'm never gonna be a champ, but I wanna practice like I'm gonna be one. I get a couple of lucky punches in early and the crowd cheers, but it's short-lived because the minute I feel her power, her punches, I back off. After a while, she pins me against the ropes and I feel her breath in my ear. She says, you keep dropping your left, I'm gonna hit you even harder. Focus, you know better. <laughs> She's teaching me. I survived three rounds. I have a bloody nose and a black eye on the way. I did okay. She didn't even break a sweat. I go sit ringside watching the next fight. I love being right here. The champ comes over and hands me an ice pack. Here, that's going to swell. You need to practice. You need to focus. You keep dropping your left. Same time tomorrow, right? Yeah. Yeah. Same time tomorrow. <laughs> boom there we go fixed yeah, that, that was a great story i actually um started boxing a couple weeks ago um definitely couldn't beat joanne if she's training with the champ but what an incredible story about um camaraderie and working together um yeah i love the, the blocking that happens and as she's saying, you know, I'm lowering my right. And she's like, don't do it. Don't do it. And she, I can feel the space in my, in my visual movie of the mind really tightens up for me while she's telling that story. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a few stories tonight that are really, like, physically driven. Um, and it's a lot of action. And this one is one of those. And I think it keeps you in the moment and really helps you imagine the story. Yeah. Uh, we're going to go on to the next story here. It's Wednesday night when I overhear my teenage son tell his friends, Ugh, doll is so overrated. And that surprises me because doll, which is lentil curry and a staple of most Indian meals, he loves it. 
He inhales it whenever I make it, so I ask him to explain himself, and he tells me, I like it. I just don't see why Americans gush about it so much. I mean, frankly, I like more American food. A couple of days go by. It's Friday now. It's been a hellish work week, and I'm standing in front of the fridge with the door open, racking my tired brain to see how I'm going to make dinner out of half an onion, two shriveled carrots, and a few chunks of rotisserie chicken, which is all that's left. And in my tired brain, I think, throw it all into a doll and flavor it with Bengali five spice so everything smells like my mom's kitchen. But then I have tremors of guilt from the doll was overrated comment because he's American Indian. He's as American as Indian and I should really give him balance. And so I think, okay, no, 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 I can make a pot pie out of this. Problem number two, no celery. And I'm thinking... Pot pie without celery is like dal without randhuni, which is this Bengali spice. And something clicks in my tired brain and I think, that is something seed. Randhuni is something seed. What is it? I get it. Make my pot pie. My son takes one bite that night and he screams, what did you put in this? I've never had pot pie so good. I've never told him the secret ingredient was randhuni, also known as celery seeds. <laughs> I uh I love that ending. Yeah. It's the, really good. It it is such a you know there's all the the talk about dad jokes and that's a super mom joke. Yeah. <laughs> I never told him the secret was celery seeds. <laughs> I love this story. I think it's I think there's such a heartwarming element to it and I think that um, growing up, like my mom was Puerto Rican and having that food from my culture was something that I didn't appreciate as a child and I always appreciated as I got older. Um, so I love that she's still cooking with that and showing that, um, it can be used in American cooking too. I thought it was a great story. Also, I've noticed, um, in the chat, people are sending a lot of love to the storytellers and I think we should keep that up. So you no know, people are looking for the recipe, so yeah, yeah, we got that. Send that along. <laughs> send that along. Yeah, it, if it would, we'll we'll post it on the website if you if you send it to me. And next up, we have oh goodness, I'm gonna butcher everybody's name, which is super lame, and I'm sorry, but it's uh, it's Crystal Bartles. That is what. The Bartles is what the internet told me that is how it's pronounced. And if you, and she's not here today to yell at me, but she might yell at me when uh, she watches it on YouTube later on the VOD. But her, her story is a whirlwind, and you're going to get to see it now. It's 12.38 on a Friday afternoon. I know it's 12.38 exactly because every Friday for the past 10 years, I've been teaching a course in physical comedy from 9.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. at a college outside of Toronto. And every Friday, if I can finish my class at exactly 12.30, if no student needs to talk to me, I can be out the studio door, lock it, be down the two flights of stairs, pulling out of the Birmingham parking lot at 12.38 p.m. Every Friday at 12.38, I call my mom. I call my mom every day, sometimes twice a day, but on Fridays at 12.38. As I'm reversing on the parking lot, I yell at Siri, call mom, but it's negated because in this exact moment, my dad is calling me. And I am close to my dad, but my dad never calls me. Hi, dad, I say as I turn left onto Kipling Avenue. Hi, Chrissy. My dad is also the only person in the world to refer to me as Chrissy. Your mom's been in an accident. I wanna pull over, but I'm in one lane of traffic and there's no hard shoulder. Uh, she was skiing and someone rammed into her from behind. She went flying. Uh, they think she's broken her pelvis. She'll be transported to another hospital. I don't know much more. Oh, a nurse wants to talk to me. I gotta go. Keep you posted. Love you. Bye. He hangs up the phone and I burst into tears. I mean, how did this happen? My mother is an amazing skier. My mother is the woman who looks after everyone. And at 68 years of age, I have truly believed that my mother is immortal. I accelerate onto the freeway and I call my husband, David. He is just as upset and concerned, but his top priority is that I get home safe. And as I make my drive all the way home, I think to myself, will my husband and I be able to board our flight in 14 hours for our beach holiday, which unbeknownst to us will be the last holiday in a very long time. My mom lies in a hospital. The pandemic hits one week later. Boom. 
I think a lot of us have that moment of this is what this is the big thing that happened right before or the the thing I had planned or it happened right after the shutdown. Yeah, and I think I think specifically with something like this where there's like an accident and you're you're thinking about somebody's mortality something that I really liked what, that she did was discussing like what goes through your head and I felt like we got like a play by play of the things that you think about big and small like even going on that vacation and if they were going to be able to do that and like also the fact of hoping that her mom's okay while her husband is hoping that she drives home safe um, there was like a lot of complex layers to like what people are caring about and thinking about in those critical moments yeah uh in a lighter note, the last message that Kristen, Crystal <laughs> sent me was, don't screw it up, Dan, or your storytelling career will be over. <laughs> so she did send me uh, how to pronounce her name. <laughs> and I, I didn't see it soon enough. Uh, bum, bum, bum. Our next story is gonna be coming up and it's Adita and I'm queuing it here one two three boom but 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 1992 I'm seven years old and I'm playing boat with my dad the rules of boat are simple I hop onto him as he's lying down on the bed flat and I have to stay on top of him as he slowly rocks himself to the left to the right. We never keep score. I mean, if he really wanted to, he could have just but but butted his way to victory by just rolling completely to one side and I would just topple over, but instead we did everything we could to let this game go on as long as possible. So in many ways, my childhood was set to the soundtrack of but 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 2012. Philip, wake up. What are you doing? What is this? My mom is shouting at my dad and shaking him. He is on the kitchen floor, laying flat. She's hysterical and looks unhinged. Mom, call 911. Doop, doop. He is flat and in the hospital. Doop, doop. Wake up, I try to negotiate. Doop, doop. I stare at him. He's not making any bad jokes. He's not sneaking into any snacks that my mom has hidden. Doop, doop. Do not float away. Move. Move, damn it. Doop, 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 doop. But, 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 but. His eyes open. And I win. Boom. Uh, yeah, that's a really beautiful rendition of that story. And... It's one of the ones that I hope to see again in various venues. Uh, it's just a great story. It makes me think about how those sorts of games that you kids play with their dads, whether it's helicopter, Superman, uh, wrestling games, and things like that. Oh, you cannot hear. Oh. There you go. Okay, I fixed I, it. I got you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, w I was saying that you, those games that you play with your dad, or I think are, are very relatable, you know, and even the people who didn't play that sort of stuff with your dad, with their dad, there's some adult out there who was like, I'm going to be a giant boat. And you'll get to play on me or like the person is the castle. And I, I really like that he could bring us back into that space. Yeah, I thought he did an amazing job. I know Adi is like, from my encounters with him, has been a very comedic person. And to see him do this was like very touching and sweet. He also has a book that has come out recently called Cheese Dosa. I think I said that right. Um, but everyone should get it. I got it. You can get it off of his Facebook. Um, I'm sure he's probably going to put a link in the chat. 
but a quick plug for him and his book. That's such a huge accomplishment. So congratulations. And we're going to move on to the next story while we are getting him to throw up uh, a link to that book in the chat. Boom. In high school, I was very naive. Few friends never dated. I did have parents who told me that I was worthless. So when I met a long-haired hippie Jesus freak, I was smitten. Dave was 36 years old. He had this dazzling smile and he just oozed charisma. I got into his van and he drove us to a deserted park. Let's get in the back on the mattress, he said. And I said, okay. He told me I should believe in this higher power that would protect me. And I said, okay. You see, Dave listened to me. He made me feel special. And this went on for two weeks. Then Dave invited me to his house and I said, okay. It was there I found out he was a member of the powerful Children of God cult. They used flirty fishing to attract new recruits. Let's go to my bedroom, he said. And I said, okay. We went upstairs and he told me again about this higher power that would keep me safe. And I just looked at his twinkling eyes. Two days later, the FBI arrested Dave. He was wanted in several states for sex crimes. And I was devastated when he was sentenced to the Atascadero Mental Hospital for Male Sex Offenders. Looking back, I realize how dangerous that situation was. But Dave was right about one thing. All the times that we were alone, there must have been a higher power watching out over us because he never touched me, not even a pat on the shoulder. Still muted. I love stories uh, about guardian angels. <laughs> and <laughs> that was a thing in my youth. We were always looking for them in my family and th thinking about the little moments, whether it's a frou-frou spiritual thing or just that idea of the opposite of looking out and seeing how often the world is out to get you and being like, there are people out there who protect you. And sometimes like, that's how it feels. Like, I think that's mostly how it feels for me. I do all these dangerous things and I rarely get in lots of trouble or hurt. <laughs> yeah, I think her story was incredible. And I think you, fit, you get a lot of her personality from how she tells it. And she seems just like unshakably positive. Like there's a part, every time I hear the story it makes me laugh where she's like, no boys talked to me and have a lot of friends, but my parents always told me I was worthless. And I was, I just think her positivity is just infectious. Um, and it really kind of um, opposes this sort of harrowing tale very well, compliments it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, next up is our third pr place winner from last time, and it is Jay Rohr. Just because you can win a fight doesn't necessarily mean that you should get into one. Case in point, I was in a blockbuster video with a young lady. Now, obviously, this is years ago because, you know, video rental store was still a reality. But anyhow, we were perusing the new releases looking for a movie to watch that weekend. And as we were going through the selection, one of the blockbuster employees approached us and said, Hey, you, where are you from? And I said, uh... Chicago? I said, no, before that. Uh, I'm from Skokie. No, before that. Where are you from originally? And I said, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. I've always lived in and around the Chicago area. And he said, why are you lying? Why don't you just tell the truth? What's your problem, man? And he starts advancing on me in a way that can only be considered an indication that he's about to throw hands. And I thought to myself, I can win this fight. Because I'm 6'1", 240, and he's a little person. I apologize for the arrogance of that presumption. But at the same time, as I thought to myself, I can win this battle physically. It occurred to me that it's not going to look good if I curb stomp 
blockbuster Peter Dinklage into paste. So, I extricated myself from the situation peacefully, walked away, never went back to that particular blockbuster. And it may not be the most macho masculine maneuver in history, but I feel like it was the smarter move not murdering someone over their paranoid delusion about my origin story. I, lo I love his delivery. Uh, he has a fantastic YouTube channel uh, where he does one-off. He, do he does a, a lot of interesting stuff. He'll do videos where he does sort of dark humor daily show. Mm -hmm. um, and he takes it in sort of a sci-fi direction and he does book reviews of esoteric books that I've never heard of before. Oh, that seems right up his alley based off how he told the story. And I think there was something darkly comedic about um, not to be glib, but being the bigger person um, in this argument. And I thought he delivered it very well. I agree with you 100%. Yeah, that, that idea of what does it mean to be macho and yeah. sometimes it is the the walking away that proves the point i was on top exactly. of the world i was on top of the world 10 years old and for the first time in my life i was commuting to school by myself no older boss's sister to tell me what to do and not to do it was just me and my killer red sport pants. My commute included a train ride to the big city and a walk to my grandma's house. When I got on that 7.30 a.m. train, it was so packed I could barely squeeze. My face was smooshed against the dirty greenish looking window on the train's door. No wonder the second I got off the train, I threw up all over me. But after I cleaned myself, off I went on my walk to my grandma's house, window shopping with a piece of cake in my hand and a bottle of cranberry juice in another, till I needed to pee really bad. With no public restrooms on the way, I decided to run to my grandma's house, whose building I could see in the distance. As I got closer, my feet stepped into a big pothole and I tumbled to the ground scratching my hands and at that moment pee just gushed down my red sport pants and tears went down my cheeks while I was wondering how I was going to tell my grandma that I peed my pants. Then all of a sudden out of the boot the skies opened up and a torrential rain soaked me to the bone in less than a minute and just like that I was again on top of the world because the rain saved me from an embarrassing explanation. And we are back. <laughs> I love that story. I think there's something um, great about, like, she really captures, like, the resilience of being a child. Like, she throws up halfway through that story and you completely forget about it because she cleans herself up and she's ready to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I just love that juxtaposition of, like, the rainy day is the day that, that the rain makes you... <laughs> You know, the rain solves the problem for once. <laughs> uh, next up, we have a story by Mark Modral. Sometimes the heat makes me stupid. I mean, I'd hitchhiked long enough to know better, had my rules of thumb, and near the top of that list is when the sun goes down, you knock off for the day because weird stuff happens at night. I was hitchhiking from Northern Wisconsin to California and I found myself on the north side of Mankato, Minnesota. And I started walking and there wasn't like any breakdown lanes at all. So I had to walk the entire length of Mankato, Minnesota. And I get to the south side and the sun's setting. I'd walk like 20 miles that day. It's damn hot, I'm dehydrated. And I'm really way behind. So I stick out a thumb and this old VW microbus pulls over. The guy says, where are you headed? I said, I'm trying to get to Interstate 90. And he says, I live just off 90, hop in. I throw my pack in and we take off. And pretty much from the instant we pull away, 
the guy starts into this tirade about what a miserable life he's had. Fucking miserable every minute. And in the middle of this tirade, he pulls off the highway and drives off into the woods. And I don't know what to make of that. And I don't want to interrupt. That would be rude. And after a while, we're getting off into the woods. And he looks at me and he says, so you hear Ed Gein died. And I said, no, who's Ed Gein? He goes, Wisconsin folk hero. And I'm thinking like Paul Bunyan. So I said, what did he do? Killed six women and made lampshades out of them. Oh, then he dug up 10 more and furnished his house. He's a guy all them psycho movies are based on. The rest of the night, I kept one hand on the door handle, ready to jump from a moving car if this shit got any weirder. Uh, yeah, I would, I would love to hear the five or 10 minute version of that where we know all the rest of the steps. Yeah. I, I'm just the defying death that that theme really came through (laughs) during these stories. People are narrowly avoiding cult leaders and serial killers, which is, I don't know, always fascinating to me. (laughs) I think that there is something there in the 99 that people go bigger. You you either have the story that has a surprise, a huge laugh, or is the story that is crazy outrageous. Yeah, exactly. Because you got in only 99 seconds, you kind of want to hook hook it enough that because you're going to be hearing 10, 20 stories, they got to keep it. Right. <laughs> and I uh, think a serial killer is a great hook to have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ed Gein's. Ed Gein's folk hero. You haven't heard of him? <laughs> I shut the thick wood door with a small square window, and as instructed, I lock it. My class of freshmen push the neat rows of desks aside and hide in the corner, out of sight through the door's window. It's early in the school year, and my sweltering classroom does not have air conditioning. Twenty-four sweaty and hormonal freshmen nervously pile in the corner. I take position on the floor between them and the door. I feel my heart rate pick up and try to take deep breaths. Just as the principal, the building manager with the master key, and the observing cop approach our room, Jason farts. Some kids giggle, and the rest go, shh, quietly plead, come on, you guys. And the doorknob jiggles as the master key unlocks it. My heart pauses as every kid grabs the nearest hand. The door flies open, and the building manager screams, bang, 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 you're all dead. It's just a routine active shooter lockdown drill, but I immediately question my entire career choice. I snap out of my existential crisis when half the students burst into tears. I gesture to the room of terrified freshmen and tell the so-called adults in charge, okay, we get the point. I abandon the lesson plan for the rest of class. Instead, I do my best to help my students process the inappropriate absurdity of what was the first of many active shooter lockdown drills. Boom. Now, it's been 20 minutes. So I want to remind you, this is celebrity judge Zach Stewart. Uh, He was the first Grand Slam winner for the first season of the 99 Seconds that Sean Wellington's Grit podcast does. And he has stories that are full of heart, and he has stories that end with weight. But his the ones that get me the best are his comedy stories. I think that your lightness... Uh, really shines through and I just want to take a moment here to say thank you so much for coming and hosting this with me again 
Oh, thank you so much. That was that was really, really nice. Um, Dan's stories are amazing, too, as well as um, this story that we just heard from Lauren. Um, I I didn't graduate that long ago. I mean, it's my 10-year high school reunion coming up, and I remember school shooting drills, but in today's times, it's, I think, elevated to this unnecessary level that's, I of not unnecessary, but this extreme level um, with how many shootings are happening. Um, and she really captured that fear um, and how terrified it must be to be a teacher and to be a student these days. Yeah, I, I loved that juxtaposition of how it starts with the kid farting and then being like, We're, this is time to take it seriously. And there's that parallel of a kid maybe not taking it seriously enough against that juxtaposition of adults taking it too far. Uh, just a beautiful story and amazing that you can fit that sort of thing into 99 seconds. Our next story is going to be our last story of the night. So I'm going to remind people to uh, make sure that you have a Twitch account. Hit that follow button. Thank you to the people who have followed prior. I know a lot of you have who are in the channel and chatting. And thank you so much to our new followers. You've put us over 100 followers. I really appreciate that. And without further ado, our next story. In the early 90s, I find myself in New York City working on Wall Street on a trading desk right in the thick of all the action. I'm not really a trader, but I'm more of a human Wikipedia. It's my job to know why stocks are up and down and what to do about it. It is a great job. Now, it does only pay about $40,000 a year, but I am promised a very, very big bonus. And I know junior traders that got easily a $300,000 bonus their first year out of college. So I am stoked and I have a really good year and I figure out that I earned the company at least $75 million in just pure profits. So I get my first bonus check and I, I just take a minute to dream and think what it'll mean to me. And I rip the envelope open and, and it says $500, $500, not 500,000. This is not what I expected. And so blind with rage, I storm in to the head honcho's office and I close the door and I say, you stole from me, you slimy, cheating, stealing bastard guy. And I I'm going to sit here and you're going to write me a new check. And, and he smirks and then he just goes back to work and ignores me. And I think I have no exit strategy. And so I continue to sit there. And after several awkward minutes, he intercoms and asks for security to come remove me from his office. And I think this can't be my exit. And then the door slams open and it's Lawrence Kudlow, world's famous Republican economist to the White House. And he says, Get out of here, kid. I got my bonus check and I'm missing a couple of zeros. And I said, me too, Larry. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> this, this story is just, I think, so funny. And I remember, like, my first job out of college um, and thinking um, I was going to make all this money and that really didn't happen. And like, you really end up rooting for Tracy. And like, you, when she goes in to talk to her boss, I like hope she gets the bonus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But there's something in it where even even the big name guy comes in also didn't get the. It's like the the guy at the top squeezes everybody below, and it's like what? Just a beautiful <laughs> Wall Street story. Um, yeah, amazing. I day traded for a living for a brief period of time. And one of my favorite things to do was to ask the, the people who'd been doing it for a long time, their like favorite trader stories. And there's just a lot of really good ones of these quirky characters who make dumb decisions and will win, 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 and then just do something wrong just because it's <laughs> such a mental game. Uh, so yeah, he hearing her win $75 million for somebody else. And they're like, you can have 500. 
warms the cockles of my heart. <laughs> that's that's the American capitalism I know and understand. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna give you guys uh, a couple minutes while we banter about. I've thrown the uh, link to vote to these things. Uh, it's on our story luck page. I'm going to also plug another thing that's happening. Uh, Storyluck.org, if you go there, our pinned post is we've started a whole new storytelling class that's based around this sort of storytelling where you're telling stories for video. And the idea of the class is there are no experts allowed. I am sick of going to classes where people make it look easy. I want the instructor to be sweating bullets and having to do lots of research uh, every week to answer the questions. And one of the things that, that came to me was this idea of who has taught me the most in my life. And it wasn't reading books. It wasn't going to classes. It was the times when I was working side by side with somebody who was either at my level or just one or two levels above because they clearly remembered the struggle that I was in. And that's when I really see the progress. So we're creating a class that's all people who have opened new YouTube accounts and were muddling our way together and it's a cohort class the first one is going gangbusters and we're going to have another one uh going in about six weeks so click on the link that i am sending you in chat and you can sign up to get information uh and you'll be on our sort of mailing list to know when that next one is launching and do that with us uh, do you have any stuff that you're working on currently? No, but I wanted to give you another intro since you gave me one. Um, and it has been 99 seconds, so people might have forgotten who you are. Um, but Dan is an incredible storyteller. Uh, he really creates these like very um, cerebral stories, and there's layers and complications. Um, I met him through Sean Wellington's storytelling um, space. But he has been working so hard um, with Story Luck, and you can see that um, with how much he's doing with his organization and doing these classes and doing these competitions. And it just shows how much he loves storytelling and how good he is at it. Um, so if you have not subscribed to Story Luck's Twitch or um, Story Luck's um, on Facebook or like checked out their blog, you should really do that. Um, I know Dan would really appreciate it. I would appreciate it too. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, that that is something that I'm very interested in storytelling is that idea of of layered stories. And I think we can fit more than we think we can. And I like pushing against those branded podcast style storytelling. And so if you feel like an outsider and you want to be doing goofy things with your stories i love being in conversation with you all right we just got one more vote right while i was saying that so i'm gonna leave it open for uh 10 ish more seconds and we are gonna find out who won all right so 10 so exciting nine eight seven it matters six five four three two one and an excellent story one everybody had somebody vote for them and i'm gonna tell you that the winner is Joanne with her boxing story. She had her story go up first. That's very difficult to win when your story goes first, but it was excellent. 
So thank you everyone who voted. And second place is and second place is Adita. And third place is Silvana Clark. So thank you guys very much. All of you, I'll be getting in touch with you and getting you your prizes. Good luck and have a great evening. Goodbye from Zach and I and goodbye from everybody at Story Luck.